So back in the last year, um, uh, listening to uh, Ham Nation uh, on, on uh, the Twit Network, and uh, Bob was one of the, uh, the major players on that. He says, you know, guys, if, if anybody needs a, um, a, a presentation for your club, uh, he's available. I, sh I shot him off an email and uh, got a reply back in, in just a few minutes. It's like he was waiting for my, my request. And we talked about it a little bit. And, um, and here he is tonight. Uh, by way of introduction, I've got a, his uh, bio here. Uh, Bob Heil is a sound and radio engineer most well known for creating the template for modern rock sound systems. He founded the Heil Sound Company in 1966. So it's a few, few, <laughs> few years ago. Um, which went on to create unique touring sound systems for bands such as Grateful Dead, The Who, Humble Pie, and invented the high-powered talk box for Peter Frampton. Uh, Bob's been a major innovator in the field of amateur radio, manufacturing microphones, satellite dishes for broadcasters and live sound engineers, and I would add everything in between. Um, won multiple awards and honors, and in 2007 became the first manufacturer to be invited to exhibit at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, Bob is well known for, his, in his, uh, for the theater organ circles. Um, and I got to talk to him about that afterwards. Um, beginning his career at the age of 15, playing the Fox Theater Wolitzer in St. Louis. In 2014, Bob was awarded an honorary doctoral degree in music and technology from the University of Missouri. Uh, and with that introduction, for someone who needs no introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Bob Heil for our main presentation today. Take it away, Bob. Thanks. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate the invite. Glad to be here. I've been listening a little uh, along here. What a fabulous club you have. Keep it up. Uh, we need more clubs like this. And, and um, I, I do a lot of these. This is getting close to number 200 I've done since March. And clubs need presentations. They need activities. And you guys... You got, it, you got it nailed, and I appreciate that. Well, I'm going to start off with some of my, uh, my slides here. I, I, if you can full screen those somehow, that would be cool, but uh, spotlight them, I guess, and that happens but however you want to do it because uh, you'll want to uh, see these full screen. <clears throat> I call this the science of audio, but it covers so much, and uh, we'll get into it. I, when I was 10 years old, I, I was playing the accordion, and what this has to do with all this is that a couple of years later, my parents uh, bought me a Hammond organ, a B3. Well, that was a very expensive thing, and they weren't wealthy people, but they thought I should have that because I was doing pretty good uh, with the uh, accordion. Well, I was taking organ lessons from Stan Can. He was the organist at the Fox Theater, and he was also a celebrity in St. Louis. He was on TV every noon uh, for a ladies' show every every day, a weekday. But that studio was across the street from Walter Ash, and I would go looking around in there. And I was only 13, 14 years old at the time, but uh, didn't do anything about it yet. But uh, two years after that, I became a professional. I was making a lot of money playing the organ at Mary Valentine's restaurant in Freeburg, Illinois. That restaurant is still there. We go and eat occasionally. And that was in 1954. But while I was there, a man came in one night and said, you need to meet Stan Can," And he, he did that. So I ended up being the substitute organist at the Fox Theater. This is a very interesting thing about my life that probably touches some of yours. And you're saying, what's that got to do with it? Stan needed somebody to help him voice and tune about 3,000 pipes from one inch to 32 foot. And in doing that, I learned to listen. Uh, you notice all those different pipes from one inch on up. Well, they all had to sound the same harmonically. Yes, they were different pitches, each one, but they had to have the same harmonic. One couldn't be mellow. One couldn't be bright. It was during that time of my life as a young kid, I learned to listen. Hearing is a physical process. Listening is a mental process, and we are really going to get into that here in another 10 or 15 minutes. But I went back, and I did become a ham. I bought a Harvey Wells SX99 and an RME converter, 
Uh, Harvey Wells is still with me. Uh, I'm on the air each morning. There it is right there. Sometimes gets uh, replaced with my ICO <laughs> uh, and all the other things. But I love AM and all the old gear that, that I built when I was a kid. But um, I was on the air about two weeks. And I, 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 first of all, I was a technician for 17 years. Why? Because I entered this ham radio market at the beginning of the largest sunspot cycle ever. And it was just amazing. Uh, I would play the organ, get home around 11 or 12 o'clock at night. Six meters were still open. I mean, to the world. If you were around, you'll agree with me. If you weren't, you think I'm crazy. No, nope, not making it up. I'm tuning around after a couple of weeks on the air, and I heard this terrible signal. Oh, my gosh. It was so distorted. And I like, what is that? I come back the next night around the same frequency. There he was. I'm going, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the gumption to call him. And so I did. And I couldn't understand him well, but I happened to be fiddling around on the buttons. Remember, I'd only been in this thing a couple of weeks. Hit the BFO button on an SX-99 and bingo, here comes a voice. It was single sideband on six meters. That was unheard of in 1956. Well, I, I would talk to him uh, every night I was home. It was K0DGE. We discovered later he was one of the very first six-meter sideband uh, stations. He had built his own rig. And I told him I'd come into St. Louis three, four times a week and play the Fox. I had time. I'd play for eight minutes, and the show would last for two or three hours. He said, well, come by and see me. I'm not very far from the Fox. I rolled up in front of his building. It was KMOX Radio. Larry Burroughs was the chief engineer of CBS. And it was a remarkable beginning of young Bob Hiles life. <clears throat> he taught me so much on those back benches of KMOX. And I, I started building things. And I said, would you build me one of those uh, single sideband rigs. No, I, I, I can't do that, Bob, but I'm going to teach you how. And he did. Went back to Walter Ash, bought a Central Electronics 10B. I built it from a kit. I would take it to him in various stages. Everything was working. I got an A plus on it, <laughs> but it had plug in coils. We didn't plug in the uh, 14 meg coil. He taught me how to use a good dip meter. And we wound a six meter coil to plug in it. But wait a minute, we were 36 megs short of 50. He taught me how to build an oscillator. Went over to Walter Ash, bought a blank chassis, 6U8, and built a 36 megacycle oscillator, plugged it in the crystal socket. Hello, radio. The station grew really quick. This was 1958. I also became an antenna nut. My loving parents. They were something special. They would allow me to do just about anything. Of course, understand I was making a lot of money as a kid. And I, so I was able to afford all this. I had uh, put up a 110-foot roan with a 36-foot-long 11-element uh, Telerex on six and uh, stacked J-beams. They were the hot thing of the uh, late 50s on uh, two meters. The interesting thing was that antenna. Well, look at that antenna again. You'll notice that are, the elements are not all horizontal. The elements are not all vertical. It was their Telerex spiral ray. And what they were trying to prove here, which worked, signals when they leave your antenna, they do not remain in the same plane. Because of phase shifts and atmospheric shifts, they're always changing polarity. So when you're talking to somebody and they take these great deep fades, it's not because they lost power. It's not because they did something different. Their, their signal's changing phase, and you really didn't have much to do with it. But that really solved the situation. Well, the next year, I bought and built a Johnson 6 and 2 Thunderbolt. So I was doing a kilowatt and a half on six and two meters. I got a call from Bob Drake. He said, are you the guy that's got that kilowatt on the VHF? I said, yes, sir. He said, I'd like to have you uh, 
come and visit one of our club meetings. He said, we do this club meeting once a year and it's a technical meeting. We uh, invite people to bring papers and, and tell us how you did some of these special things. We checked with the ARRL and we think you're one of only 10 on single sideband with a kilowatt. How'd you do it? Well, I went there. I had a friend that had a Bonanza airplane. He was on two meters with me down in Murfreesboro, Southern Illinois. So we flew off and went to the Biltmore Hotel. And what they did at the Biltmore is they took all the furniture out of one of the floors. They had the Collins room, the Drake room, the Mosley room, Central Electronics, and all these guys were there. As a young kid, I was mesmerized because these were like celebrities. I read about them in the magazine because I was reading the magazines like crazy to learn as much as I could. Where was this? Of course, it was the Dayton Hamvention, one of the very first. There were 600 people there. They held it there until 64 when they moved to Hera Arena. While I was there, a fellow from the UK came to me with the, from the J-Beam company. He said, we're looking for somebody like you with a big signal on two meters. We'd like to do an experiment. Would you like to put my antenna up and do that? Hey, no, not my vocabulary. So he sent it over. It was 128 elements on two meters. Now, I was very fortunate that about eight miles down the road from Marissa, Illinois, my home, was a Motorola dealer, K9SGD, and a contractor that had booms and cranes and all of that, K9EBA. They helped me put up the 110-footer uh, years before that. But they, they helped me with this. There's no way I could do all the phasing harnesses and all of the work. But we had two prop pitch motors on it so we could rotate it and point it to the moon. Didn't know where it was going, but it was certainly a wonderful thing for this young kid. Well, in 1961... I built a band switching transferter, the SB62. I built another uh, 20A. I built a 20A. I had a, that's a, a band switching. It You didn't have coils in it. And um, it's still with me. In fact, it's uh, right there. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we had that tied up to the, to the uh, Johnson six and two, uh, it was, is a pretty serious station. And I got a job with CQ magazine in, in that same year. Uh, I was the VHF editor for, for a VHF single sideband column. That's how rare single sideband was to VHF. And that's why I didn't need to be on 20 meters or anywhere else. I was fast, having a fascinating time on VHF in those years. And I also wrote for another magazine called VHF Amateur. And uh, there I built a, as a project and one of the issues, I built a, a six meter transferter and told them how to do it. It was very simple. It only had three tubes, a 63, 60, and the final did about 15 or 20 watts and um, 10 or 12 resistors, a few capacitors. And we were trying to get people on it. So this is very cool that we could do this. And it was because of the VHF bands. Amateur radio was my college professor. I built many VHF stations. I was a nut for building and carrying on. But I also, at the same time, got a job at the Holiday Inn in St. Louis. It was the largest Holiday Inn in the chain. And they had a four-star German restaurant there. I was there for six years. And I built a pipe organ and installed it in that restaurant. All the pipes were behind glass. All of those instruments you see, they were all active from the keyboard, just like the Wurlitzer Theater organ. Only here, I took uh, actuators from a pinball machine. They were just solenoids. Actually had the piano to work from all the keys. I had a marimba and all that. Fascinating thing. We had people come from all over the United States to spend a weekend at the Holiday Inn and uh, enjoy this marvelous thing. Well, I had been playing uh, about 12 years professionally. I barely made it through high school. I didn't have time for high school and I was making a lot of money. So what do I need all this for? And um, I, uh, 
I barely did make it through, uh, but I didn't have good grades, but I didn't care. Well, I, I went back to my hometown of Marissa, Illinois, about 50 miles south of St. Louis. My parents had a clothing store there. In fact, you'll see my dad standing in the doorway of that building down halfway there. He had a white shirt on. That's uh, mom and dad's um, Bob shop. It was a men's clothing and shoe store. Well, I started a music shop. Didn't know exactly where it was going to go, but um, I just thought I could do that. I got a Hammond organ franchise, and that was really the key to it. I was selling a lot of Hammond organs because in that time, Hammond organs were very common to people's homes. And it was a big deal to have a B3 Hammond. And I was building three and four manual ones and doing all kinds of crazy things with them and cutting them uh, apart, uh, taking about 200 pounds off of all the wood and stuff because groups were starting to carry them around. And I also rented them uh, Hammonds to the uh, arenas and the concert halls in the St. Louis area. But in doing that, why well, I, I made some big inroads with a lot of those groups, but the bands finally discovered there was a guy with a soldering iron and uh, I was working with all kinds of local bands in the Midwest. We're talking about people like Michael McDonald, REO Speedwagon, they weren't known by that. These kids were still in high school, but they were buying their instruments and letting me build things for them and so on. Danny Fogelberg, just a whole bunch of those guys of that nature, and they were young kids. Well, I wanted to do something better with their PA because it was terrible. And the Fox is giving away, they were throwing out, really, those two big large cabinets you see two of my road guys on top of. They had put, been put in in 1932. Uh, into the fox and they were doing new stuff so they threw them away well hams don't throw anything away so they asked me if i'd like to have them and i said sure so we started building a pretty good sized sound systems as you see and uh, they were doing um uh, things called the cavalcade of stars in st louis yeah, once a month they have all kinds of of country stars would come up and they all really really were thrilled with the sound system because they had never played through anything like that. I didn't know it. I, I wasn't out on the, on the circuit with them. Well, I got another call from the Fox Theater. He said, hey, Heil, you still have those big cabinets I gave you a couple years back? I said, I do. He said, well, uh, you need to talk to this guy because they came in here this afternoon and their PA was confiscated. And they don't have any PA here. Talk to this guy. This guy was Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead. Any of you historians of music, you know what's going on now. Their sound man, Owsley, was on probation out of the state of California because he was one of the innovators of LSD. And he was on probation, should have been in jail, but they were going to sneak this little tour and New Orleans, St. Louis, out to the East Coast. Nobody would know that. Well, they did. The FBI and DEA sat in the back row that night when the concert was over. The band came on to St. Louis, didn't have cell phones. So they came on to St. Louis. And when they got on the stage the next afternoon, where's Owsley? So they called back on the landline and found out he's in jail. And so talking to, to Jerry, yeah, I told him I had Macintosh amps. I never will forget it. They almost dropped the phone. You have Macintosh amps. Nobody does. I said, yes, sir. I have JBL speakers, Olson bins. You get that stuff up here. And uh, so I did. And we did. The, the, the. This is just a piece of the stage. The sound system's way off to the side. There was a journalist there that wrote an article. You can write this down. Look into Google. The night rock and roll sound was born. I didn't know any better that no one else had been doing it at this level. That article appeared in, in Billboard magazine and all heck broke loose. My phone was ringing off the, off the wall. All of these people were coming to me, Jeff Beck and, and Humble Pie, uh, Jethro Tall, Joe Walsh, that's all these people. And we were doing their, their sound for them. Well, you're looking at a very straight guy. 
all through my 80 years, I've never tasted beer. I've never smoked anything. And for gosh sakes, never did drugs. I'm looking at this as a business. I did a couple of those tours and they were frightful. Uh, the band would come in and one guy would have a Volkswagen van with some of the stuff and another guy would have a pickup truck and he didn't get there till two hours later. And I go, this can't happen. And so Heil Sound was the first company to do an actual tour. I leased a 40 foot semi, that's the biggest one we had in those days. And I bought an old Greyhound bus and we built 11 beds in it so I could sweet, uh, sleep the roadies. And it was really taken off because everybody heard about it. This group's guy heard about it. Their manager said, hey, you're the guy that got that big, loud PA, right? And I said, yes, sir. Well, I need it. I got this band and they're just starting up. I need them. They're really loud. And that was their first job on the first tour. That's ZZ Top without beards. That's how early that is. We're still friends. I had to make friends with all of these groups. If I couldn't be friends with them, I didn't want to work with them. But I got another phone call. And the guy was very adamant. You got to get that PA. I mean, he, he just ripped off. You got to get that PA up here in Boston tomorrow. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? I said, well, we're out with Chaka, Can uh, Chaka Khan. We're in Chicago doing some shows with there. Well, we don't care who you are or what you're doing. You need to be here tomorrow night because we're in big trouble. <laughs> wait a minute. Like you're coming on with all that. Who are you? Who are you? He said, we are the who. Oh, boy. I said, but I can't get there. I, if Even if I could get my friend, I had a friend in Chicago that could cover the date. How could I get there? I mean, we have a 40-foot semi and a Greyhound bus. We can't make it after the gig tonight. We can't be there tomorrow afternoon. Well, you go out to the airport and you rent a Tiger Air Freight, which I did. I hope you're paying for this, which they did. And we drove the semi and we drove the bus in and we did save their pretty much the career. They had not been over here in four or five years. They had all new music. Townsend had written some beautiful new stuff. But the last time they, be, they had been here was Tommy. Well, what are we going to do here? Hmm. We did it. And we were with them actually for six years. But the first two years, we did the Who's Next Tour. It was very, very cool. They took a year off because he had another project he was working on. He called me and he said, hey, come over. I want to talk to you. I got an, I got an idea and you're going to be the guy to do this. So I go to in London and I go to his studio, which is up, up above his home on the Thames River. Just loaded. Now, I understand this is 1963, loaded with all kinds of synthesizers and uh, keyboards. Uh, it had a, a Steinway nine foot piano, lots of guitars, drums, and so on. Well, that red chair you see there, that's sitting in front of a little $900 Lowry home organ. And I had always wondered how he did this. Well, you can see in the upper picture, he had that home organ tied in with that, with that synthesizer. And so what you see was the, it was the beginning of his quadrophenia. Quadrophenia was a, a big deal. He wanted to build a sound system that would, we would be able to move Roger's voice around the hall. And I said, well, why can't we do that? So we did. It was just at the right time where we had been working with our sister company, IES, on building a true mixer. Nobody had ever done it yet. They built mixers but they didn't have anything of high quality. They were for other purposes. This was the first mixer for a, a true rock and roll concert. But 
again, my life was made with such great timing. It just happened. I was so blessed by many things. We were just a couple of months before he was ready to take Quadrophenia on tour, and we could add two more channels to it. And so we did. And Quadrophenia hit the market, and oh, buddy, uh, we really, really were having fun. Big time. And so the whole thing was, I was doing things at that time that was uncalled for for, for just a ham radio operator because I wasn't an engineer, but I was able to build and do things. And uh, they were very, very happy with some of the things we did. Well, one of the big things that I gave to the market were monitors. You see, the bigger the PA, the, the less you hear it on the stage. <clears throat> you don't hear your, your other part standing 10 feet away from you because if you used monitors, they fed back. Well, I devised a way with the Grateful Dead by using two microphones and it worked really good. We're going to get into this big time in just a few minutes. And here you're seeing Entwistle with right at a thousand watts, not more than eight feet from him and it didn't feed back. How'd I do that? Phasing. And it really, really caught on. We, I had all kinds of people coming to me. Billy Graham's people came. I was with Billy for two years on the road because he had never had a monitor or any kind of system. But that could pretty much winds up some of all that. I want to get into some really serious stuff. At that time, as this was 72, I got this call. I got a call from Paul Klipsch. Paul Klipsch was the father of, of the whole hi-fi movement. And he was the father of the folded horn. <clears throat> that He called it the K horn. <clears throat> that sat into the corner of a room with two eight-foot walls on each side. Those eight-foot walls became the last part of a 16-foot folded horn. Your room was actually a speaker. If you've never experienced a K horn and you ever get a chance, do it. I'm telling you, it was an amazing, an amazing thing. And I was so blessed. He called me. He called me. Hi, you the guy that's got that big PA? And I said, yes, sir. He says, I want to come and see it. I'm going, oh, my gosh. He's going to cut me off at the knees. What he didn't, he flew his Bonanza up to Sparta, Illinois, a few miles down the road, went and picked him up all day long. He was much taller than I. Well, why did you do that? Well, how come you did that? Where'd you learn to do that? Well, how come you did that? W did that work? All of these questions never cut me down, never did. In he thought it was incredible that somebody could do it at this level. Okay. Well, we got in his airplane that night, went back to Hope, Arkansas, where his lab was. Spent the night with he and his wife, Belle. And uh, what he did changed my life. And I'm going to share some things with you right now that I would hope change yours because these are things you never read about. And I want to know why. And it's why I spend all of these hours and days and years trying to bring this technology, not just only in products, but trying to teach guys what it's really like when you know how something works. What happened that really woke me up was the thing that Paul guided me to. It was a study of the Bell Labs. He referred to the Bell Labs as the idea factory of the 1920s. That was a consolidation of AT&T and Western Electric. Western was the manufacturing arm of the Bell system. Now, get this. Listen up. They had 4,000 scientists and engineers assigned to the newly created Bell Telephone Labs. But here's why. 
they were fully dedicated in researching how the human ear worked and what frequencies were most important to understand the spoken word and communications. Any of that ring bells with you? Well, it all started with the telephone company. Here's what happened. It's a great demonstration that I don't think you'll ever regret hearing because it's going to probably change what you hear and do. Here's the deal. What they did is they put two wires together from New Jersey all the way across America to the West Coast. When they turned on the telephone system, this is what they heard. It's like, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. What happened? What they discovered is there was no articulation. It was all like this. Why? Why? Well, they put Dr. Fletcher and Dr. Munson on the curve, and this is what our human ear looks like. I know exactly what you're saying. My ear doesn't sound like that. Oh, yes, it does. All of us have this problem. We have huge holes in audio. And the louder it gets, the flatter it is. That's why kids like to listen to, to their car radios or their hi-fi systems really loud. If it's up over 100 dB, it's almost flat. But down where you're listening now, at 20 dB, it's got holes in it. What are we going to do with all this expense? The telephone system was going to fail. Well, Dr. Fletcher and Dr. Munson and the 4,000 scientists discovered something very interesting. We needed elevated 2.5K. That is the magic sweet spot. And you're going to say, well, no, it's got to be flat. No, it doesn't. You want to hear it flat? There it is, flat. It has no life, and especially if you're trying to communicate through a noisy band. You need communications, and that all happens when I turn 2.5 up. All I am doing is one knob, one control in this paramet parametric EQ. I'm turning the mids from 400 to 3K. And when it hits 2.5, it's like, wow, I'll do it again. I'm not touching the bass. I'm not touching anything. I just took out the mid-range. What's interesting is you probably think that I turned up the bass. No, I didn't. Your ears have tremendous response to frequencies. And that mid-range is going to come screaming. Here we go. And it will overpower the bass because you're just screaming to hear that articulation. And there you is. The minute it comes on, you know when it happened. Hmm. So for all the guys say, oh, Heil's full of crap. It's got to be flat. I just proved to you, no, it doesn't. And if you want to argue with 4,000 scientists, I can probably get you a, a, an appointment with a few of them. <laughs> you want to roll off everything under 100. It just waste RF energy. Maximum speech articulation. That happens between 2 and 3K. And so for those that say, oh, shut up, hi, oh, I don't need any darn EQ. <laughs> Got news for you. We all do. And just about everything you have is equalized. No, it might not have a bass and treble control, but the engineers have pre-equalized it for you. In ham radio, it's very important because we're after trying to get our signal through pileups and noise. What did you just learn? 2.5 is the magic spot. I was off the air for 12 years out on the road, didn't touch a radio at all. And I come back into radio 
and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I, it was just, it was a big shock because I wanted to know what happened to my great Art Collins audio. It was gone. What happened to it? Well, what happened was all the import rigs came in. Yeah. All they had was mic gain. That was it. 2.4 maybe, if you were lucky. Bandwidth, transmitter bandwidth. I said, I have to do something. And so I did. I built the first equalizer for ham radio. Up until this time, that was not a known word. I wrote an article for this. It's just a little simple two band bass and treble. I was the engineer, 160 on the low end. Where was the mids? You know where it was, 2.5K. I could boost or I could notch those two frequencies. I wrote an article for a QST. They published it. The ARRL called me and said, this is going to win our cover award and it's going to be the lead article. And I was so honored. I said, my, it's just a little box. I said, yeah, but it has significant movement that's never been done in ham radio. And they were right. I built it as a do it yourself article, <laughs> but oh, maybe a couple thousand did, but I had to call the, well, that plant was closed. We were out of the rock and roll business or anything else. <clears throat> what do you do? Uh, I called some of my best solder gals back and bingo, we started building thousands of, of them. And so all because of something that I did that I thought was very, very important. Well, what it did for us, it was a, we were able to put our signal where we wanted it. You're never going to forget this one. I have a balloon. Now think about this balloon as your RF signal. It's 3K wide, okay? Maybe 2.9. <laughs> 3K wide, all right? All right. Well, if we could equalize that and narrow that up a bit and put all the emphasis on 2.5K, what do you think would happen to our RF? It's not going to go away it's going to go up at 2.5K, right, where we have all of our energy. We have an open door for that RF, 2.5K. You're going to argue with 4,000 scientists? I don't think so. You can get on 75 meters and argue with all your buddies tomorrow, but you're wrong. This is science. And once you figure it out, you can become, become the big dog on the planet. But then you have to be able to feather it out. Contest stations, DX stations, they all absolutely love what we did in those days. We built elements specifically for different things. We built the HC5s for Rag Chew. You know, it's kind of a kind of a full range. But then we built the HC4, and that sucker had nothing under 600 cycles. It was like crazy. So those things all really brought a lot of interest to what was going on. And uh, we started building the elements, HC4s and 5s, built hundreds of thousands of them. Shortly after I got got into that, I got a phone call in 1985 from the Southern California DX group. They said, hey, we love your, your elements. We're duct taping, taping them to our old headsets because nobody was building any communications headset at the time. And so what I did is I built the first headset and that was the BM10. Some of you still might have one. It was a marvelous guy. And we still build it. I took it off the market maybe, oh, it was maybe like 12 years ago. Took it off the market for a few years. I thought people were going to burn my plant down. Bring that back. <laughs> and 
And so we did. And we also did that, but we made it better to, uh, in some respects. Uh, the backpackers are loving the BM-17. And then we make, we got in with ICOM. I'm going to get into that in a minute. That was one just for ICOM. And of course, what always intrigued me was how stupid and bad sounding handy talkies were. <sighs> so we fixed it. This is kind of a recent product. It is amazing for 50 bucks what it does to a handy talkie. And now <laughs> that is the headset for the great 705. You know about this, I bet you. Uh, what an incredible thing this is. It's a 7300 in a little box, and it is something to behold. And I, I have more fun with it. But uh, if, you, uh, if you don't have one of these, grab it but you're going to have to buy one of our little 50 buck headsets it really works great with it well along about 99 i get a letter from dr inaway inaway communications icom and he had a picture of his station. He had one of the fabulous 781s. Remember that IC781? It was the first one with a screen on it. It was a real CRT. He had a, one of these, yes, and my gold line. And I'm going, whoa. Hmm, interesting. He said, I'm thinking of new radio line and I want your EQ in it. It's the first time a manufacturer had ever thought about it, but this woke him up. So the Pro 1, the Pro 2, the Pro 3, all the way through the entire line, even into the 705, has my two-band EQ in it. I also got them to raise the gain. That's another story for another day. When they first came to the market in 1960, I think it was three or four, they had no preamp. It was in the microphone. That was kind of silly. And um, they had real, that when they put it back in in the 720s and 30s, they were real low gain. And after I got with them, it was along about the 735 and 45, they finally raised it up a little, but not really a lot. So you can't use dynamic microphones really well. You can, but you really got to crank it hard and they work certain ones but we built a special mic because he said i want you to build microphone for us and we did if you don't know about the icm you better know if you have an icom it's the best hundred bucks you'll ever spend comes with its own cable it won't work on kenwood it won't work on yesu bingo but what happened was education the manuals weren't really clear. So we started in writing our own thing. If you've never been to our website and under the support where it uh, shows uh, all things Yesu, all things ICOM, all things Kenwood, it's about 50, 60 pages. That's pretty cool. But this is what we show you. This is how you do it. You roll off the low end and you punch up the treble, about 3 dB. But the very first thing you ever do to a radio, the minute you turn it on, adjust the transmit bandwidth. How wide do you want your signal? If you're going to do DX word work, you want it this wide. But if you're going to do other things, okay. But you have to adjust that, and it, it's there. You'll note here, it, uh, it's noted, it's at 100 on the low end and 2,900 on the top. Okay, here comes the DX guys. First of all, you adjust it at 500 to 2,500. I don't want anything in the low end. I don't need anything above 25. Then you roll off all you have in the base, minus five, and you punch up plus five on the treble. And all of these are the same. All of the... Uh, uh, the ICOMs, they all have, might, might be a little different uh, looks of the, uh, the, the uh, 
graphics, but they're all the same. There you are, minus two, plus three, set the bandwidth, and uh, so on. And there's that wonderful microphone. I'm telling you, it really is a sensation. I'm really proud of this because it's helped so many. They don't have to spend a lot of money. Dr. Hasegawa come to me a couple of years later at Dayton. He said, we want to do this, but we want to do it better. I said, well, then that means you're going to, uh, you're going to do a parametric, huh? Yeah, that'd be good. I said, nah, not so fast. Why? I said, education. What do you mean? I said, well, you know, with two band shelving EQ, you got bass and treble and you don't have to worry about it. You either plus or minus, that's it. Well, what about parametric? I said, well, are you ready for this? And all of you, are you ready for this? There aren't two controls. There are nine. Nine. And that's why so many Yesus are still in the default mode. I hear guys on the radio because I'm on every day listening around. And I am so sad because they're afraid. Nobody's ever taught them. And the manuals are a joke. I don't even figure it out. And all these silly graphs, that don't mean anything. Tell us what means something. There are three filters. I'm, I'm going to teach you in about two minutes how to set up a parametric EQ. There are three filters, okay? Three. They each have the same controls. They have a level control. They have a frequency control, and they have a bandwidth, the audio bandwidth. And all you have to do is figure it out. That's the problem, because a lot of people are really not into audio, so they don't know exactly where to set all this. It's really simple. Check this out. We're going to set the first filter. Let's take the first one. Frequency level width. We're going to set the frequency at 200. We're going to set it at minus three. We're going to start rolling off that low end. And it's going to be two octaves wide. That's not, that's not transmit bandwidth. Now that's octaves. That means that two octaves, that 200 will reach up to 400 and down 200. First one's done. Okay, what's the second one? There's a weird thing that happens in audio. I've heard it all my life. Something about it between 900 and the 1200 cycles. It's a real boxy sound. You put your hands up to your ears. You'll hear what I'm talking about. It's real, yeah, get rid of it. So we do. You set it at 900 minus three, two octaves. You already are ahead of me. You know what the third one's going to be. It's going to be 2.5K and that baby's going to be plus eight. And we'll make it three octaves. Was that hard? No. Now you have to go in first and set the transmit bandwidth. That's easy. And listen up, listen up. Don't forget this one. Because only Yesu has a save control. You do all of these things. And if you don't hit the save button, you're back to zero. So you have to do all of this. Frequency level width. Frequency level width. Frequency level width. Was that difficult? No. And save it. And it is, it, it's just so simple. But all of that's on our pages. If you had never done this, you know we need to go in. We're building a new website. It's even going to be crazier. But tons of engineering went into this thing, the web engineering. But we need, need to have these things. But then you get into the thing, simple things of uh, how to use a microphone. <laughs> Are you crazy, Kyle? What do you mean? I know how to you talk in it. Yeah. Yeah, but do you talk into it like this? Because I hear a lot of you guys doing this. You got a desk stand. <laughs> And you take that you take that stupid desk stand and it's about oh three feet from you. Huh. Well now wait a minute. Watch and listen what happens when I take that away. Listen what happened to my audio. Uh-huh. They say, well, that's stupid, Hyle. You just turn it up. Well, if I turn it up. It sounds like I'm in a gymnasium or a roller rink. 
So you don't want to do that. Here is the science of it. Every time you double the distance of the source, you lose six decibel. Now think about this. If you double your power, that's three dB. You're going to lose six dB every time you did this, and you're going to lose another six and another six. You don't want to do that. That is exactly why in 1981, I was the first company that brought booms to this industry. Because now you, I did it for myself because I'm constantly, you never see me around here without one of these guys, a soldering iron. And so I'm always soldering stuff. I told you I'm working on some things there. <laughs> it's so important to know how to use a microphone and a lot of people don't use a microphone. The other thing that's very important is a lot of people have more air exited from their mouth and it causes the diaphragm to go down into the voice coil. We have plosives, so P's and P's get popped. Well, use a windscreen, but don't think every windscreen is the same. You go to Walmart and buy one for a buck. No, they're not acoustically transparent. These are, I mean, we have these manufactured and they're very stringent when I have these made. We throw some of them out because they're not transparent. Because I'll hear guys, everyone, hey, Bill, take that stupid muff off. It's making you muff. Uh, if they did, they got some ding dong thing that shouldn't be there. Might as well put your sock over it. But they're very, very important that you do that. And it just, it just gets into the point where you have to think about it a little bit. I had a home in California for about six years. I went out to help Joe. We were doing some things, studio and stuff. He said, I want you to build me a decent microphone. I said, what's wrong with what you're using? Well, <laughs> the stupid ball mic, I got to hold it right here and I can't move it. I want to be able to move it around, really. You mean move it around like this, right? And it doesn't go away. That's right. But I also want to get rid of what's behind me. I'm going to unplug this. So we were talking about what we could do to make the perfect microphone for most of broadcast and recording and some stage work. Never dreamed it was going to end up in, in a ham radio market. This is the PR40. And like most of our microphones, yes, you can go wherever you want on the front. It's Omni. You can't do that with other microphones because you hold it here, it's fine. You know, you've seen everybody, entertainers are gonna be right here. No, you don't have to be. But then he wanted the rear to go away. And so I did it. Watch the screen and listen. This thing is the only microphone on the planet that will do 40 dB of rear rejection. Are you ready? Oh, it still works, but it's 40 down. How did I do that? Huh? Well, again, ham radio is all about phasing. Every microphone out there other than ours has four little holes around this edge of the, L of the diaphragm up at the top. And that's the only entrance for rear rejection. Well, that's crazy. So, first of all, we were the first to ever build a large diaphragm. Up to now, no one's done it. We've, we're it. You look at the microphones. Oh, they might be big in size, but they got a little half inch and three quarter. This thing's an inch and three quarter, uh, inch and three eighths. It's big. I figured out how to do it. But then I don't have four little holes around. I opened up the whole bottom of the element because anything coming up in the bottom of the elements out of phase and it's like whoa then that is going to be canceled yes it is and we have now absolutely caused some incredible movement 
in the broadcast industry. Sirius Radio tossed their RE things. All kinds of networks are using the PR-77. And we're so happy because we've, we've developed a product that's not just a warmed over product. The recording studios have discovered this thing because of the rear rejection and all of that. And it was all because of ham radio. I am, an, I am a nut for phasing. Check this out. One of my favorite subjects is phasing. And I learned it. Remember that big antenna I had? That was just one of the things. I have two microphones. These are PR-22s. I was commissioned by Paul Rogers of Bad Company years ago to build him a microphone that was very articulate, that didn't need a lot of equalization because his sound man out there didn't know how to do it. <laughs> That's his words. Yeah, they're different colors. We have a custom shop, and we can build you just about anything you want in the custom of a microphone. This was the late Charlie Daniels microphone. They built this for Charlie. He was a great American. We were on the road with him for about 13, 14 years. I miss him a lot. I had the guys build me one, too. Anyway, ready for this? Oh, while we're here, we talked about 3dB. Do you know how loud 3dB is? Hmm? If you were running 500 watts and you weren't making it because you didn't equalize your signal, you had the wrong microphone. And so you just went and bought a kilowatt, 500. We went from 500 to a kilowatt. How's it going to be a kilowatt? You can get on the air and say, I'm running our kilowatt. Really? Watch and listen. Here comes 3dB. Let's see if you can hear the difference. There's 3dB. Wait a minute. You know, earlier I talked about listening. Close your eyes. Do this. I'm going to take away 3 dB. Heck, this could be thousands of dollars. Here it goes. One, two, three. You know why you couldn't hear it? Because those 4,000 scientists told us if you study their papers, the human being can't detect 3 dB. It's true. So you're wasting your money. Instead of buying that kilowatt, Figure out how to adjust your equalizer and get the right microphone. And that thousand or two thousand you were going to spend on the amp, give it to your wife so she can buy more shoes and purses. Now you got something, buddy. I'm telling you, that's what you want to do. I know firsthand. I have this magic little plug. Again, you're never going to forget this next few minutes. This little plug is backwards. I built it. Purposely. Why would you do that? Well, I did this to teach you guys and gals a few things. This microphone is out of phase. When I talk into it, the diaphragm doesn't go down. It comes up. This one, the diaphragm does go down. What happens when I talk into these two microphones that are totally 180 degrees out of phase? Nothing. Nothing. All they still work, but not together. Hello. Now, how many hours do we have? And I'm serious. You think about so many things. How, some idiot flies on your frequency, big carrier, you hit the notch filter, and he goes away. How'd that happen? Hmm, how'd that happen? <laughs> Takes his signal out of phase, really. And, and it, it just goes on and on and on. And a lot of people don't realize it. Who brought single sideband to ham radio? I know what you're going to tell me. Art Collins. Nope, he was six years late. It was Wes Shum with Central Electronics. Let me unplug this. Wes was a genius. Uh, how did he get rid of the other sideband? How did he delete the carrier? How's your notch filter work? How does your Yagi work? How do noise canceling headsets work? It's all about phasing. <clears throat> the, the Yagi thing always gets me. If you have a Yagi, do you know how it works? Do you really know how it works? Probably not. I didn't. Gosh, I went probably 20 some years before I finally 
applied some of this and it's like, whoa. Remember, Dr. Yagi had no computer. He had no modeling, whatever that is. <clears throat> he figured out by just experimenting, he put a driven element at a determined frequency on a boom. Then he went out so far and so long and he could get gain. Then he went so far behind and so long and he could get rejection. Whoa, that's amazing. That is amazing. And it all happens because of phasing. And, you know, I, I always... We have just completed the installation. I always wanted to do something with a phased erase, but I never, I never thought <laughs> that I could uh, afford it, so to speak. Well, was I fooled? Check this out. We have just completed the installation of a 75-meter phased array antenna system consisting of a pair of coaxial dipoles mounted atop a pair of 55-foot telephone poles. We put them in an inverted V fashion, and the poles are 64 foot apart. These are 500 foot from the operating position, fed with RG213. In order to make the antennas directive from east to west, we use a delay line of 43 foot here on 75 meters that's switched in and out of the driven element, either east or west. The down lead length is 126 foot. We take all of that coax, the down lead length, the 43 foot phasing delay line, and mounted them in a container, one of the plastic container boxes that we actually buried. And just the top of it shows. It's all sealed, so it's waterproof. But that's the way we get to switch all the components from 500 foot using one of the Amatron RCS 8V remote switches. It really works well. Take a listen to how we can get at least 10 to 20 dB difference east to west. Like a lot of people do, I, mine's usually three inches or so, Did you know, that's just after you did done mow it. And uh, I know, you know, probably... Uh, uh, you know, we get a dry day. I'm I'm going to have to lay out there and mow. That's just all there is to it because, you know, if you leave it that high, when it starts growing in it all, it's looking, ra it gets looking ragged pretty quick. So uh, it's, uh, it's to that point now. And uh, the system really performs on weak signals. Take a listen as we switch to the direction they're coming from. Also note, the preamplifier makes no difference on 75 meters on this signal. The preamplifier, of course, make the meter read higher. But in many cases, the preamplifier does not cause the weak signal to be more readable. Check it out. I hope you understand what an incredible thing that is. I was living in the Ozarks uh, back in uh, about 10 years ago, and I we had five and a half acres there. And that... Uh, that was really something because I could work my guys in, uh, in California on the AM nets, put all my power that way. You know, it's, it's, it's a very simple thing. And what did it cost? I already had the dipoles. I went to the co-op electric company and they gave me the telephone poles. They, had like, they have like 1,900 footers and they'll get rotted off. And so they cut them off and they want to get rid of them. They'll give them to you. You just got to go get them. I had a farmer that had a drill. That's how we did it. The other thing that I, uh, you know, I had all kinds of people are building switches. It's just one relay. And I was going to build my own, but I had one of the RC switches. And uh, why not? Uh, DX Engineering has some good stuff. But I do not like rotary switches. I hate them. <laughs> so... 
I went to Antique Electric Supply. If you've never been there, you need to go look it up. I bought Les Paul guitar switches, and I could switch all of it without a, that stupid rotary. I also have them to switch other antennas. The colored ones switch different uh, transmitters. There's 30 relays in this system, and it's all done with switches and relays. Why not? I don't want any. <laughs> <laughs> been doing that for a long, long time. But the situation is that I, I learned so much from ham radio and, and it really, it really got us to places that I never dreamed. Uh, we, we knew the producer of last man standing and uh, he said, you know, I think we're going to put some production in our shows. And they did uh, wrote, uh, I'm sure some of you saw it that in, they, it pertained of ham radio. And uh, I think about a dozen of them was of the crew got their license and on the breaks, we'd get on the air. That was a working station that had antennas up on the roof. Tim Allen even got so interested. He got his call. So, you know, those, those things were, they were just monumental me, to me. And of course, the other side, we could be here all night, but just briefly, uh, incredible stars from Carrie Underwood, Slash, Paul Rogers, Keith, Irwin, all, all these guys, actually scores of them use Heil microphones. And uh, can they do it because they're so special, as I've proven to you tonight, they're not just another microphone. And it's all because of the phasing I learned and antennas, and it goes back to that 128 element guy. And just things that, as a young kid, I learned playing the organ. Uh, we also, I, I got out of that whole rock and roll scene. Some of the stuff that really got me out was the fact that we started being contracted to do festivals. And, oh, you know, this one was supposed to be uh, uh, 20,000. It ended up at about 150,000 people. And we had a very unique thing that we did where we had three big road systems and we'd take those and have two stages in between so that we could have one set up while one was playing that saved a lot of problems because the guys and gals didn't get restless but this is the kind of thing I said you know what I think I'm going to do something else I wrote the book uh, in 1966 these are all things I learned from ham radio but they're just simple little things about how to stack your cabinets and get three to six dB just by putting the speakers in the right place. Where'd I learn that? Paul Klipsch. And, and that book is, is just hundreds of thousands out there. I then wrote a book. If you don't have this, I please advise you to get it. And you need to be buying them as a club. We have dozens of clubs that buy these to give all of their newcomers because I didn't write this book. I compiled it. It has articles in there that are 60, 70 years old, but it's all good old stuff that we need and nobody's doing it. You get these handbooks. Oh, give me a break. You got to be a third degree engineer to, to even think about it. So that, that didn't, that didn't get anywhere with me. I said, eh. And then one of the, I guess the thing that <laughs> kind of crazy that really put Heil on the map was uh, meeting up with this guy, WB6ACU, got with Joe and, and the James gang. And a couple of dates into the first tour, we found out we were hams. We have been buddies ever since. And he got out of that and uh, he said, hey, I'm going to do a solo act. But he said, I recorded a thing in Nashville that Bill and Dottie West, uh, good friends of his, had invited him to that studio. And they had this little box and it had a little big speaker and it was a little hose and they put it in their mouth and they could make a little weird sounds. He said, how are we going to do that live? Well, uh, two ham radio operators. Why not? We'd Went to our plant one night, and uh, we 
brought out a piece of fiberglass I had. It was actually a, a muffler for a, a, ba- a, fox, a, a box fan. Uh, you know, the four-inch box fan fit on the end of that. Well, we col- covered that, put the driver in it, bingo, hams, we did it. And it had a 250-watt driver in it. And what become of it? Well, you know what become of it. It was very... <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that's what happened to it. <laughs> and along the way, uh, I remember a, a while back, I showed you a picture of a bunch of people, Humble Pie. We did almost every concert they did in America in their career. They had a guitarist they brought over here, a young guitarist. He was about 17. His name was Peter Frampton. Mm-hmm. Peter and I, as I told you earlier, I became friends with these people. If I couldn't be friends, I didn't want to work with them. And uh, his manager, shortly after they got really popular over here, pulled him out as a solo act and called me and he said, make him sound good. Well, he had found a little gal over here. Her name was Penny McCall. And I had met up with Penny before, but she called me one day. I needed to get married over here. That happened a lot, you know, married in our home in Marissa. But after all that, she called me and said, hey, I need a Christmas present for Peter Frampton. I said, really? Okay, don't send him a guitar. He's got a lot of them. So what did I send him? Of course I did. (laughs) I sent her a talk box. You can write the rest of this history for darn sure. He's the only one that can actually make it say words. And he's told me many times we're we're really good friends. And he said it it took about a year of him. He just took off, got in a studio and just started. He had to learn the whole alphabet. But there he did, you know. And uh, we built thousands of those. It's still in production. Uh, Another ham radio uh, venture here was... uh, Tony Bongiovi, uh, owned, uh, Tony Bongiovi owned the largest uh, station, uh, recording station in New York City. It was the old power station. Streisand, Sinatra, all those guys and gals were doing things there. He was a ham. I'm, I usually meet him on 40 meters late night. And uh, he told me when I says, hey, you need to call me, Heil. I need one of them box things. I, what are we talking about? One of them box things. Are you talking about the talk box? Yeah, I got this nephew. He's sweeping the floors here. I, he's cute. The girls are like him, and we can get him a contract. We, we need a hook. I said, you do? Well, um, I can take care of that. And, of course, we did. Wow. <laughs> I could be here all night. I got uh, to spend 25 years on KMOX radio. Uh, we were doing all kinds of things and high-tech toys in those days. Uh, something that's long gone because it's all invented now. And uh, we were talking about things from cell phones. They weren't around, CDs, so on. But I also got into the satellite business. And we're not talking about just any kind of satellite. We're talking about big stuff. Put in thousands of C-band, you know, the 10-footers. And I um, I got into doing home theaters. We're not talking about uh, $400 ones. We're talking about two and $300,000 rooms with high definition. This is 1986 with high definition projectors and laser disc and uh, Macintosh amps and all of that. <clears throat> well, because of all of that, I got into designing people's rooms and uh, I got, I got a, a note from a gal one day. She come by my store and said, uh, Hey, I got this basement in this old house. What do you think you can do with that? I said, well, no, it's not in my vocabulary. That's what we did with it. And that, back behind those curtains. That's what that was. Now the guy said, Hey, what do we do with that? I said, that's what we do with it. And so on and so forth. And it's all because of ham radio. But I got into this satellite business because of of all of that. We had great audio, but nobody was taking advantage. I did. And uh, started really making things happen. Uh, the uh, 
consumer electronic shows would hire me to bring some of our theaters and set them up and all that. And at one of them, the Hubbard family came to me and said, um, hey, you're the perfect guy. We're thinking about something. We just spent $60 million and we bought a license for the first K band. That means way up there, right? Ha ha, the dish could be smaller. And so I was one of 10 people on the experimental team for direct TV. I also, I, at that time, I was also on ABC television doing my high tech uh, Heil thing. And uh, we were, we went live from CES to tell the world it's here. We've been talking about it for years. The RCA president came, he, uh, we, we put the first direct TV system in a home in St. Louis. That's our plant. That's the front of it today. Doesn't have the inflatables. That was for the big weekend. And during all this, I mean, this goes on and on and on. Ray Dolby came to me and I started working with him. To, we brought his ProLogic. He had a prototype and we brought it out to the market. And I mean, this just goes on and on. It, it, it almost gets tiresome, but it's all because of ham radio and it's why I'm here. I want people to know what a fantastic hobby this is. And we need to tell the world how great it is. And we're still doing great things. And one of the neatest things I've done lately has been the headset. There's been a couple of people try to do this, but they, they're race car drivers. What the hell are they doing in the audio business? It's very different than all. First of all, it's Paul Clips written all over it. I was able to put the speaker way back here and tune the cavity to that speaker so there was no dis no distortion, no phase distortion. It's about an inch from your ear, so the hear hearing aid guys really love it. has a balance control, left to right, and I put a monitor jack in it so you could plug your blogger or a listener into there. You didn't need Y cords, but it's the only headset that has phase reversal. Why would you have that in a headset? I learned this when I was working at Skywalker Ranch in the home theater days. You can move things around in your head acoustically. The major D expeditions all use Pro 7s and that's why, first of all, it, relieves tension of listening all of the here you can change that and these are things that i just continue to think about and bring to you but last but not least what do you do about your receiver working for all these companies i'm always asking why don't you do something with the receiver oh it's fine it's no i'm not talking about sensitivity selectivity I'm talking about audio, because if this might be a surprise to you, sorry, I work in those things and I just go ballistic. Every single solitary transceiver has one watt at 10% distortion at best. Oh, I know, some of the $15,000 have two watts. Give me a break. Then they got a little junky speaker. Well, yeah, but I bought the matching speaker. You got a dang speaker that's got the same speaker in it. They painted the same color and they fooled you for years, just like they did years ago when you had a matching microphone. Give me a break. These companies don't build their own microphones. They OEM and paint them the same color. You've been fueled for years. We solved that. And we're so proud of what we can do for all of ham radio, because now we have things that really do work. I want to do something with the receiver. What do you do? Well, there are all kinds of things out there, little powered speakers and all this. And no. So I built, first of all, a speaker. It isn't one or two watts at 10% distortion, which all of them are. If you own a powered speaker, measure it. You'll be surprised. So I built a speaker with 25 watts. Why so much? Headroom. Man, you use just a small portion of it. This thing is 25 watts at 0.1 percent that's hi-fi levels look at the speaker in it so now what do you do with it Heil? this is what you do with it i built the very first 
system that does wonderful things to your receiver. And I call it the parametric receive audio system. And it's something that we all need. And I think you're going to learn a lot in the next couple of minutes about how we can help your station. Here's the deal. This has three filters. It has a high filter shelving at 6K plus or minus. It has a low filter at 160 Hertz plus or minus. But the mid-range, and you already know this, you know, learned it earlier, how important is 2.5K? It's everything. So I build a parametric so you can get the gain. We'll just set the gain there. You don't have to touch that. But we're going to be able to rotate it from 400 to 4K. And when it hits around 2K, 2.5, it's a magic spot. And it's it. it it's just, I call it a miracle box myself because it does incredible things. Here's a couple of things I did. I did this off air. And how I did it, I have another output here. This is a receive jack out. And I plug that into Audacity, into the computer, or however you want to record things and save it. You don't need a bunch of Y cords. You don't have to worry about being overly distorted, whatever. It's beautiful. Then I have not one. I have two headphone amplifiers. I have one and number two separate. So you can have a logger. You can have an operator. Or check this out you can have left side right side so if you have a hearing imbalance i can't tell you how many emails and letters i get thanking me i give them their radio back because they can finally the hear things sure these the tapes will say it all here it is here's the way you hear him ready Here it is, flat. For a Sierra, a Sierra, a Germany. I hope I have it right. But it is ATL from Ireland. And it's a Lean Green India Alpha Mic. Over. That's the way you hear him. Echo India, a Bravo, a Lima Bravo. EI ATLB calling him right. Do I have to say any more? Nope. It speaks for itself. And I'm really, really happy and proud of this because I've helped so many guys get their radio back because they can finally hear something. I don't, you know, I, this is not just a ham station. It's, it's a lab. These companies send me radios to do checks and build things for them. I got closets full of radios, but most of my time, by the way, is spent over there. If anybody asks me, where are you on there? Most of that stuff. <laughs> or, or, or things like this. And any of you get into my pine board project? If you didn't, oh, buddy, I love building. We had over a 1,000 people follow us on this deal. Go to, Ham, uh, go to our website, uh, website hylesound.com, and down at the bottom of the page, you'll see pine board. And there's about 50, 60 things in there. The last thing I want to talk to you about is your connectors. This always ticked me off. The connectors are terrible that we have to use. They're little bitty CB connectors. That's what they are. Foster's the company that owns the patent. I had to get special permission from them to change it. And here's the problem. The connectors are all like this. Little bitty ring. Gonna need needle nose for it. And look at that. They have to wrap it with heat shrink or black tape or something. It all pulls out after a while. I said, no, we're going to change the world. We did. The connector is incredible. The, the, the wire, I designed the wire and the cable clamp together. So when you clamp it down, you can just feel a clamp right on it. You could tow your car with it. And the second one coming out is push to talk. But the cable... Oh, boy. I hit a home run plus on this one. All the cable you have is 26, maybe 24 gauge. Big deal. 
that's insane. This is 18 gauge, and the shield is 100% silver braid. It's not just wrapped. And the push to talk lines, which carry DC, is outside of that shield. I have really, I'm serious about this. I have solved more RFI problems than you can imagine just by changing the cable. Because you got that DC laying right next to that real sensitive AC inside a shield. That's nuts. Where are these engineers? I don't understand it. And as I told you in the beginning, we're very blessed and honored. We're the only manufacturer in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. There's that Quadrophenia console and the mixer uh, that we use for some of that. And then the, uh, uh, one of the monitors, uh, the backside of that is the Easy Tops mixer, so on and so forth. And I, I, I just, this really takes me back because I barely got out of high school and last uh, couple of years ago. I was given an honorary PhD at Mizzou. And the whole thing is during my presentation to the graduates, I told them I, I learned all of this after I got out of uh, college, right? No, I didn't go to college. I went one year and said, that's it. So no matter what your schooling is, you have to have something else that you can learn and keep you going. Amateur radio was it for me and i hope it's a lot for you i'm sorry to be so long but this was the shortened version of it <laughs> and i hope you'll learn something and i hope you contact me send me emails call me i'm always here that is my job these days i sometimes answer up to 20 30 calls a day and i love it to share with you and i i, I had a guy today had a problem so we get on skype I could see what he was doing. Hey, we'll, we'll fix it. No charge. I, I love sharing this hobby. And I thank you so much for your time here. And uh, what we're doing now with some of the, like almost 200 we've done, we're coming back doing two and third one. We pick out a subject, phasing, spend quite a bit of, you know, or whatever. If you want to do that, I'm yours. I love to share things with my fellow hams thanks a lot there's got to be some questions don't you know don't be afraid let me know what you got we'll make it happen bob this is greg thank you very much for the presentation it was fantastic thank uh, you i learned a lot uh, i've got a puzzle that um so on the back of his house is my yesu microphone it's got a tone switch one and two and they're telling me that it's got a relationship to the language you're speaking. That's all they tell me. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> it's a gimmick, like most things are. It's a gimmick. If you really want to do it, you, what kind of, which radio is it? It's a Yesu MH1 as the mic. One is One position is for... Uh -uh. North America, the other position is for like Japanese. Uh -uh. What is the transmitter? Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a Yesu, uh, 847. 847. Does it have an equalizer in it? Of course not. <laughs> it, it doesn't? No. Um, I, adv I, advi I advise you to go find out how to do that. There's several of them out there. W2IHY is one. And it'll be a world of difference when you get an equalizer. Yeah, no, I, I, I so... When I, when, I, when I edit the the the, uh, the video here, I'm gonna listen carefully to what you, what you uh, you did because I, th I think there's an answer answer to my problem in 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 your your talk today. You got it. Okay. Anybody else? Doctor Heil, I have a question. Yes. This was a a, a a thing that was sticking in my mind for quite a while, and it had to do with the color purple, and. It was a trivia question that I did not find out the answer to, and I was wondering if you could share it. No. I, I'm <laughs> waiting for somebody to come out. I can't believe no one has figured it out. 
<laughs> to do not, it has nothing to do with Jimi Hendrix, although that was one of the first shows that I did was Jimi Hendrix. And I got to tell you, uh, <laughs> when he put that lighter fluid across his guitar, we were mixing at the front of the stage, and he was about four feet in front of me. And he put that lighter fluid on his guitar and lit it up in this fiery, right? I'm going, why the heck am I in this business? Where's the door? <laughs> <laughs> you know his purple haze and all that nope had nothing to do with it it has a distinguished absolutely defined answer i just been a real jerk because i'm just wanting to see if anybody ever figured it out <laughs> so if That's i do fun. you will if somebody comes up with it we'll let you know man it'll be all over the media <laughs> okay very well if you don't have fun don't do it right yeah more questions yeah, thanks, Bob. It's Carl. I've talked to you in the past. On Paul Klipsch, he used to have the notes from Hope. Yeah. Were they great? Are you ever going to do anything like that? You know what? We're thinking about it. And what we're doing, my, my media team has been over a year trying to rebuild the the website and it is so intense they're really having problems i had a meeting with them today and we are going to do something like that i did it uh back in the oh golly it would have been in maybe 70 no when would that have been no it would have been about 82 or three right after the equalizer thing called harmonics from heil and it was in some of the magazines, CQ and so on, but I didn't do very many of them. But I had a lot of stuff, and I, I need to be writing these. I also need to write a book. Everybody, every one of these I do, somebody comes up and well, why don't you put this in a book? Uh, <laughs> the book is going to be about that thick. But um, I've written six books, but uh, they're all technical things. I hope you have my handbook. It's The handbook is yeah. special. And I... Uh, I don't know how to do it. I don't know, but I've gotten some ideas. And anybody who write books, come to me. Let, give me ideas. <laughs> yeah. All right. More questions for uh, for Bob. Bob, I saw you on a uh, Ham Nation with Joe Walsh a while back, and uh, it was really interesting. He started out being a ham when he was a teenager, way way before his Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I, I think he was living in New York and getting stir crazy and saw an antenna hanging off of some guy's roof and followed the wire. Yep. Yep. He did. I tell you that kind of the end of that story, some few years back, a guy came to me and he said, you're a good friend of Joe's, aren't you? And I said, yes, sir. He said, I want you to give this to me, uh, to him. And Jim was the guy that had the antenna on the roof and helped Joe learn and get his license. And he had with him, Jim had his logbook where he made contact with Joe. It was Joe's first contact. And I gave it to Joe. He was thrilled to have it. Jim passed away a few years ago. But see, those are the kind of things that make our skirt fly up. I mean, a lot of people say, well, that's a big deal. No, it was a major deal, major deal. And and so you never know, but this ho this hobby's full of major things that we do. And so we need to go out and f wave the flag a little more. All right. Any more questions for Bob? Uh, yeah, Bob, this is Guy, W6GUI. When are you going to do Hell of a Sound, like the musical, right? I mean, you got to have a musical. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I could perform it there. That's about 10 feet in front of me, by the way. And, uh, you know, I guess never thought about it, but I'd probably be worse than writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> we had another question. Uh, yeah, I just had a uh, quick comment. Uh, I uh, like to uh, thank Bob as uh, I'm a fan of uh, electric radio magazine. All right. And I, uh, uh, Bob is uh, always uh, gracious enough to have a, uh, a full-page uh, ad in here, which uh, supports the uh, magazine. It does have a lot of good uh, information, that uh, some of which uh, has been uh, brought up this evening. So I do appreciate your uh, involvement with electric radio. Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I write things every once in a while. I wrote a thing on my Harvey Wells back in, uh, no, it was on my ICO back in 216, how to put push to talk in it, about four pages. That was, that was pretty cool. But uh, I love Ray. He's done a lot, and uh, we got to keep it going. If you don't subscribe to Electric Radio, do it. It's not very expensive, but oh boy, it's got so much stuff in it. Good stuff. Did we have another question? All right, Bob. Hey, on behalf of Sierra Foothills Amateur Radio Club, we really want to thank you for taking your time. Uh, to spend it with us. Uh, it's been an incredible evening. And uh, and certainly uh, my life would be a little bit different had you not challenged me on a radio show five years ago why I didn't have a ham radio license. <laughs> so it's, it's your fault, and uh, oh, I thank you for it. <laughs> you're very welcome. All right. All right, everybody, open up your microphones. Let's uh, in, inundate Bob with some audio uh, appreciation. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things that I do, this is up to you now. I'm going to shut this microphone off. And before I walk out the door over there, I'm going to go sit at the console and I'll play a little five, five, seven, nah, about a 10 second, whatever. So I'll play a little, uh, little thing for you on, on the, the big organ, if you'd like to hear it. Awesome. Time yeah. is yours. And you can just fade me out <laughs> as we do that. So good night, everybody. And we'll uh, talk again soon. I hope I get to come back. So stand by. Here comes the big guy. Mm -hmm.